Hey everybody, welcome. I'm hoping you're having a good weekend. I'm uh, sitting here in my hotel room in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where I'm broadcasting the show today. I spoke yesterday at a conference here uh, for students, about 150, 60 students. Uh, you know, really, really great event. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, we keep tracking the news and, and watching going on in the world. And I have to say, it's nuts. The, 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 the country is just crazy. I mean, things are just insane. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just watching it more closely these days, or, or, or maybe that's just, just it's always been like this. I don't think so. I, th I think things are getting worse. It's just, just the insanity is getting crazier and crazier and crazier all the time. Well, the Democratic Party need, it seems to be imploding with accusations of uh, the elections being rigged. Now, we all knew this, that Hillary Clinton would do anything to get the nomination on the on the Democratic side. So it's not really surprising, but now the Democrats themselves are kind of admitting this, that that's kind of, that that I'd say is the surprising part of it. Um, and, and of course, on the Republican side, uh, the, the Republican Party is imploding. Uh, the two Bushes, father and son, both former presidents came out uh, you know, really going after uh, Trump and and uh, stating how much they dislike Trump. I'm no fan of the Bushes. Of course, I'm no fan of Donald Trump either, as as you probably know. Uh, but it just it, it it's more illustration of how of the insanity of of just both political parties uh, are imploding. I still think I don't know. Nobody nobody is listening to me, but I still think we need a third party in this country. And yeah, I know if we have a third party, the, the, you know, it'll probably hand it over to the Democrats or whatever. Or who knows what the realignment is going to be. So many of Donald Trump's policies come from the left that, uh, you know, we need a realignment of politics because what we have today is so, it's just, it's just nutty. And nobody, nobody in politics today actually represents America. Nobody in politics today actually represents the founding principles or the Constitution, or what this country really represents. Nobody on the political map today represents anything close to, you know, free markets, to capitalism, to to uh, what we've traditionally thought of as uh, as as America. Individual rights. Nobody talks about that. And, and we'll, we'll cover a few topics that, that show that, although uh, I'm just so sick of politics. Um, so it's, it's a crazy world, I think. What, what can I say? Uh, it's, uh, it, and, and it's not getting better. It, it's going to get much worse before it gets better. We're going to talk today. I want to talk about what's going on on campuses, particularly. I don't know if any of you have been following what's going on in, in, at Reed College, Reed College in Portland, Oregon, uh, one of the best liberal arts uh, colleges in the country. Um, huge number of PhDs in the humanities come out of Reed College. So future professors, future professors of humanities are today's Reed College students. So huge, huge impact on our culture in the future. So what happens at Reed College turns out to be very important to uh, to the future of education in this country. And that's scary because uh, I'll tell you what's going on over there. But it's it's mind boggling how ridiculous and how how insane what is going on at Reed is actually. So uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, Middlebury College. I, I like talking about what's going on in universities because, look, that's the future. That's the future. Th those are future leaders. Those are future professors. Those are future business people. It's, it's the future, right? Young people are the future by definition. And uh, those who attend the more prestigious colleges, those who become PhDs, have a disproportionate impact on the kind of world we're going to have in the future. All right. So, yeah, I think we should have, uh, going back to politics, I think we should have a third party, a third party that stands for, I don't know, it doesn't have to be a third party that agrees with me necessarily. That would be insane. And would probably uh, result in um, losing in a landslide, right? Because even you listening don't always agree with me. Never mind the people who are not listening who dramatically disagree with me. 
But uh, we need a third party that at least has some semblance of sanity because the Republican and Democratic parties have completely lost all principle, all sanity, all integrity. Uh, and and it's, it's just uh, a disaster. Uh, tax reform is a good example of that. So uh, we're getting more information about the tax bill. Every, every, every day a little bit more trickles out. I think we'll, we'll get a, a much better sense, much better sense of the tax bill um, next, uh, yeah, next, next week when the Senate bill is introduced. We've got, we've got a lot of indication of what the House bill is going to include. But, but this is one thing we know. At the personal tax level, it's an utter confusing uh, disaster. It's... It's more complexity, not less complexity. If this was intended to simplify our taxes and reduce our taxes, it's not going to do either one of those. This tax bill is going to massively complicate our lives. It's going to create more ways to game the system. It's good, you know, which might be good if you if you can pay for a high priced accountant who can help you do that. And it's going to increase taxes on many people. It's not going to tax rate. It's not going to cut taxes for uh, the wealthiest Americans, uh, where you get the most benefit from cutting taxes, because the wealthiest Americans tend to do what with the excess money they have. What What do you do if you have a lot of money? What do you do with the excess money you have? You save it because you can only consume so much. So wealthy Americans are the ones who save, and that's what you want. You want more saving in the U.S. economy because saving is investment. Investment is job creation. Investment is increased opportunities. Investment is increased economic growth. Investment is what drives the U.S. economy. Saving is what drives any economy. But no, this tax bill is to a large extent driven towards increasing consumption and not increasing saving, which is nutty uh, and, and uh, is, is destructive to the long-term health of the U.S. economy. But long-term, there's a word politicians have no idea what to do with. Long-term? Who cares about the long-term? You know, they, they think in terms of two years or, or six years, or, or maybe one year, I don't know. They certainly don't think in terms of anything approaching, uh, you know, the long-term. So, uh, yeah, we have a, a completely insane, uh, you know, ridiculous tax uh, proposal that is, that is going to be introduced, uh, complex. The only good part of it, and you know, I have to say something good. The only good part of it is that they're going to cut to corporate taxes. Corporate taxes are going to go down, are going to go down probably to 20%. I think that's, that's the one thing that's probably really going to happen. Uh, nothing else once it goes through the Senate and the House and everything else. Who knows what's going to appear in the final bill. But the one thing we know is the corporate taxes will be cut to 20%. That's good. Uh, but it's good for all the wrong reasons, or for all the reasons, different reasons of what people claim. Actually, it, cutting corporate taxes does a few things. It, it, uh, it reduces prices in the economy. So it's anti-inflationary in the sense of price inflation because uh, it increases competition. Uh, if your profit margin goes up, it gives you more... more opportunity to cut prices. Somebody in a competitive market will cut the prices and force everybody else to cut prices. So it actually reduces prices in the economy. And it turns out it raises wages. It raises wages uh, directly, again, because of competition for labor. So it, it, an interesting, and it actually does not increase profits over the long run. Profits come down. Competition drives profits down. The nature of competitive markets is to reduce profits. This is economics 101. So all the people who think that uh, cutting the corporate tax rate, uh, you should see spikes in um, in the stock market are just wrong. They, they don't understand economics. They don't understand how finance and economic actually work. Cutting the corporate tax rate actually does two things. One, it results in... Um, prices going down generally in the economy, and two, it results in increased wages. Now, the additional advantage of, of this tax plan is it will encourage American corporations to bring some of the, of the, of the dollars 
that they have overseas back to the United States. So it might encourage increase, increase investment, uh, increase, and they're also going to allow um, deductibility of capital investment in, in year one without depreciation. So that will increase investment. That's also good for wages. That's also good for job creation. So that's the one part of the bill that's good. I mean, I believe that the only good corporate tax rate, the only appropriate corporate tax rate, put aside even the moral issue, but from a purely economic perspective, is zero. Again, because corporate taxes are passed on to consumers and to, and to workers, the only legitimate corporate tax rate is zero. Uh, and uh, if you want to tax workers and if you want to tax consumers, make it explicit, have a, you know, have a, uh, a sales tax, if that's really your goal. But of course, politicians love hidden taxes, which is what a corporate tax is. And everybody loves, everybody loves to tax corporations because they're kind of evil and they're bad. And so it's easy to tax corporations. But the fact is, corporations don't pay taxes. Only individuals pay taxes. And it turns out that the individuals who actually pay the tax are not even shareholders. The individuals who actually pay the tax are consumers and workers, and the people who benefit when the tax is cut are consumers and workers. So, uh, yeah, so that's a good part of the tax bill. So, you know, once in a while I see something positive about what's happening in politics, but it's, it's pretty unusual because so little good happens in that world. All right, we're going to take a quick break uh, to pay the bills. Uh, you're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back after this break. All right, we're talking about the insanity in American politics, but the insanity is even greater on American campuses. We'll get to that. I, I want to say something about something a little bit more about taxes and, and what, a, what a proper tax simplification, tax reduction, tax elimination would be good. Bill would actually look like. And then why I think taxes, and this might come as a shock, are not that important in, in, in the, from an economic perspective in terms of what the United States is looking at. So what would a tax bill look like? Well, first, it would be flatter and it would be simpler. The amount of lost wealth devoted to figuring out loopholes and deductions and exclusions, paying tax accountants, and I hope my tax accountants is not listening to this show, um, to paying tax accountants huge amounts of money to figure out how to minimize our taxes and how, how, to, how, to, how to just not even minimize our taxes, how to just figure out what taxes we're supposed to pay by law. And I'm not sure there is such a thing because I think it's all ambiguous. And partially, we're probably all violating the law at some point because of the complexity of the system. So many regulations that government puts together and tax code the government puts together are purposefully done in a way that you're always in violation. So they can choose when to go after you and when not to go after you. When you're a criminal and when you're not a criminal. They get to decide. You know, it's, 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 this is ex the violation of the rule of law. Laws are supposed to be simple so that anybody who has to abide by the law can understand them. I venture to say that none of you, not a single one of you listening today, unless you're a professional tax accountant, understands the tax code or will understand the tax code after the Republicans have finished with this ridiculous bill that they're putting together. So the first principle has to be simplicity. Then it has to be flatness. There's, it's unjust. It's immoral. For, for, for somebody who makes a lot of money, creates a lot of wealth, produces a lot, works hard to pay more taxes than anybody else. By working hard, by producing, by creating, you know, you want to penalize that? Is that the system we live in in America today? We want to penalize hard work. We want to penalize innovation. We want to penalize wealth creation. Oh, no, we don't want that behavior. You know, one, one principle you can always think about is this. Anything you tax, you get less of. Anything you tax, you get less of. Anything you subsidize, you typically get more of. So if you tax people for working, if you tax people for wealth creation, if you tax people for innovating, you'll get less of that. 
Th that's another reason why the most important tax to reduce is the top marginal rate. They're the most productive, the most innovative, the most wealth creating people in our economy. They shouldn't have to pay that much, that much more taxes. They already contribute so much to all of our lives by creating the wealth that we all enjoy, by creating jobs that we all benefit from. <clears throat> Their taxes should be cut first, deeply, as much as possible. So simplicity and flatness not happening in this tax bill. They're, they're keeping the top marginal income tax rate at 39.6. They're increasing the complexity. They're, they're decreasing some of our deductions, but not completely to zero. I would like simplicity would mean no deductions, no exclusions, no social engineering. We talked about that last show. None of that is happening. So, so in that sense, it's a disaster. What a waste. What a wasted opportunity. Republicans have a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate, and a president who will basically sign anything they send him. And what do they do with that opportunity? Squander it. Throw it away. Do nothing with it. Just like they do with Obamacare. Nothing, right? And then, second point is that from an economic perspective, even from the perspective of the role of government, taxes are not that important. What's really important is government spending. The more the government spends, the more it's intervening in our lives, the more it's getting involved in the economy, the more it's distorting the world in which we live. The more the government spends, it means it's regulating more. It means it's redistributing more. It means it's growing in terms of the scope of its activities. If you want real reform of government, what you have to do is cut government spending. Now, there used to be a theory. Uh, actually, Milton Friedman held this theory. One of, the, one of the things I disagree with Milton Friedman on is that if you cut taxes, you cut government revenues, you starve government for funds, then Congress will be forced to cut spending. That's turned out to be completely bogus. It turns out that Congress has no problem spending money it doesn't have over and over and over again. It has no problem, no problem. Spending and spending and spending and filling that gap up, that gap up with borrowing. It keeps raising the debt limit. It keeps increasing borrowing. It keeps increasing the deficit, increasing the size of government debt with no end in sight. That's politicians have no sense that they're being starved, that they that they need to cut spending because there's less revenue. No. And as long as the bond market, as long as the Chinese or whoever's buying Japanese and others who are buying American bonds, government bonds, and insurance companies and pension plans are willing to continue to buy those bonds at historically low interest rates. There's nothing to stop our politicians from continuously raising the debt limit, continuously borrowing more and more and more. And from an economic perspective, that's like taxes because they're sucking money out of the private economy. Now, I know some of you are saying, but wait a minute, it's cool because the Chinese get to fund all this. But if the Chinese weren't buying government bonds, what would they have to do? Because they have a lot of dollars, you know, because they we buy their stuff. This is this is the story Donald Trump and all those anti-trade people never tell you. They buy we buy all their stuff and they get dollars. They get these pieces of paper called dollars and they have to do something with these dollars. They don't just sit in the bank in China. What do they do with the dollars? Well, they buy a lot of government debt. But if they couldn't buy government debt, what would they have to do with those dollars? They'd have to invest them in the U.S. economy. They'd have to bring them here and buy real things. And we would all benefit from that. The dollars would flow back to the U.S. They'd flow into American industries. There'd be more money to invest. There'd be more money to produce, to create, to create jobs. So... The money has to flow back to the U.S., whether through government bonds or elsewhere. When they flow into government bonds, all they're doing is funding government consumption. Instead of funding 
expansion of business, instead of funding job creation, they fund the government. What a waste. What a waste. So whether the government raises money through taxes or through the bond market, through debt, doesn't really matter. And at the end of the day, we all know that the debt has to be paid. At least we think we know. I mean, I think a lot of Americans are under the delusion that you can keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. You keep increasing government debt and increasing government debt and never have to pay it back. I mean, that seems to be the premise under which we all live. But you have to pay it back one day. And how are you going to do that? The, 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 the debt, I think, now is $20 trillion. It means you're going to have to raise a lot of taxes from our children and grandchildren. And by the way, the debt is going to increase at least another $10 trillion, $20 trillion. And that doesn't include Medicare and Social Security, where the debt from those is probably somewhere around $100 trillion. How are you going to pay that? I mean, the only way to pay that is to raise taxes or to print money. Either way, a disaster for the U.S. economy, a disaster for our kids and grandkids. So at every level, what the government is doing, it's bad for our economy today, and it's a disaster for our economy in the future. And the Republicans, instead of starting to cut spending, reduce the deficit, are putzing around with a tax plan that is meaningless, that's going to do nothing for this economy, or very little for this economy, except for the corporate side of it, and pretending that here they are, they are the defenders of free market. Nonsense. I mean, if I could swear, I would swear, but I'm not, I'm not supposed to swear on the radio. But, you know, because it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. I mean, okay, you, you can understand when Obama was president, they raised taxes, you know, and, 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 but here are the Republicans, House, Senate, White House. They can't cut spending, and they can't even really significantly, meaningfully cut or simplify our tax code. We need a third party. We need to get rid of these Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I'm for draining the swamp, really draining the swamp, not Donald Trump-style draining the swamp. After the break, I want to talk just for a little bit about his selection for the Federal Reserve, his nomination of power for the Federal Reserve, more swampiness. I'm for draining the swamp, getting rid of all of them, and we need something new. Not Trump new. Trump is old, and Trump is mindless. We need something new and thoughtful. All right, you're listening to Yaron Brook, angry about Washington, and and we'll be back after this break. You know, and my frustration only grew this week because, and we've talked about this in a previous show about the Federal Reserve and and uh, Trump's nominees for the Federal Reserve and and the options he had, and and I predicted he wouldn't do anything radical that he would nominate somebody he could control like i thought he would go with the status quo and just keep yelling on and he didn't do that he went with even somebody less informed and less meaningful this guy powell uh and it's just it's just stunning to me but but not i guess it's not stunning because it's not surprising it's exactly what i predicted and nobody powell is a nobody who's done nothing who, who stands for nothing he's a middle of the road compromiser he's a republican but meaningless. He's always sought compromise. He's always been in the middle. He supported Benanke. He supported Yellen. He has no interesting position on, on monetary policy. He is a nothing. A nobody. And all of you Trump fans, I don't get it. I, don't, I really, I still continuously don't get it. When he continuously proves that he's not, doesn't believe in free market, he doesn't believe in, in, in limited government, he is a big government, you know, uh, central planning, central planner in charge. He is the swamp. Trump is the swamp. And yet, people still support him. I, I, don't, I don't, I really, it bewilders me. It bewilders me that how people can continue to support this guy in spite of everything that he does, no matter what he does now, as many of you know, <clears throat> I believe that the Federal Reserve should be abolished. I don't believe there should be a Federal Reserve. And, and not just abolished, not just turned over to the Treasury or something like that. I mean private banking 
I mean banks issuing currency the way it used to be in America, the way America used to function, right? But better than it used to be. We could design a, a banking system far, far better than it was before we had a Federal Reserve with no Federal Reserve. But that's not going to happen. So at least appoint somebody to the Federal Reserve who has a point of view, who, who, who stands for something. And, and one of the nominees was like that, a guy named John Taylor, who's a Stanford economist, who's a free market economist, maybe one of the better economists in the world today. Uh, and, and, you know, an interesting guy. I don't agree with him. Again, I don't believe there should be a Federal Reserve, which I certainly, I certainly don't think uh, John Taylor believes. He's a, he's a pro-Federal Reserve guy. But at least he has a, a, a view of monetary policy. He believes in, in, in limiting inflation. He has something called the Taylor Rule, which adjusts. Anyway, I, I don't want to get into the technicalities of it. And I'm not sure the Taylor Rule is the right rule to have. But the point is, he, he's, he's somebody with gravitas. And that's exactly what Trump doesn't want. He doesn't want anybody with an opinion. He doesn't want anybody to challenge him. He wants somebody who will do what he tells them to do and so much for the fed for the fed's independence now let me just address one quick issue on the fed and maybe i can do a a, a whole segment one of these days on the federal reserve and what it is but i know there's a certain percentage of the listeners out there who believe that the fed is a private institution and is run by private bankers for the benefit of private bankers and there's a whole conspiracy theories around it maybe even by jewish bankers that that that's the ultimate right and let me just say, none of that is true. The Federal Reserve is a branch of the U.S. government. The Federal Reserve is a government entity. The chairman of the Federal Reserve is nominated by the president and approved by Congress. The members of the board of the Federal Reserve are ultimately government appointees. The Federal Reserve reports to Congress. It is a government entity. It's supposed to be relatively independent, but it is beholden to the president and to Congress. What do you think happens to the profits? Federal Reserve, particularly over the last few years, has been incredibly profitable. I, I hate to use that term, profit, when it comes to the Federal Reserve, because it doesn't produce or create anything. It's not a productive function. So the, the money they have left over, what do you think happens to it? it gets distributed to the banks, the people who, who control the Federal Reserve, supposedly? No. No. Like any government entity, what happens to the profits is they get sent to the Treasury. It goes to the government. It's part of government spending. So the Federal Reserve is a government entity, a government program through and through. All right. So, I, you know, it's, um, it's sad that you had an opportunity to appoint somebody, a, a, a talented economist like John Taylor, and, and they skipped it. Of course, I'm not even talking about appointing somebody to the Federal Reserve who would have actually maybe even talked about, at least used the opportunity to talk about how much better life could be without a Federal Reserve. Um, like somebody like John Allison, who, who was the CEO of bb and and uh, the CEO of the Cato Institute and is on the Ayn Rand Institute Board of Directors. Uh, at some point, he was talked about as a possibility, but that would have never happened. Congress would have never approved him, and the president certainly would have nominated an independent thinker like John Allison, not this president, not Trump. Trump is not interested in talent. He's interested in yes men, and, and most of his conflicts have been with with people who are actually independent and who have an opinion. Okay, I want to switch, switch dramatically, switch um, context, and I want to talk about, I want to talk about Reed College. Reed College, uh, um, Reed College is is one of the top colleges in the country. Uh, it produces more PhDs in the humanities, I think, than um, than any other college in the United States. Let me see. Let me see if I got that statistic right. But yeah, I, I, it, it's a it's one of the top humanities pr projects, right? So 
it ranks second, no, not first, the second for future PhDs in the humanities and fourth in all of the subjects. It's also, it's also, and this should tell you a lot about this, uh, the most left-wing liberal student body. So it's considered to have the most left-wing liberal student body. Now that should tell you something about future professors. If this college produces, ranks second for future PhDs, so these are going to be influential PhDs, which means teachers, and they start off before they even get to college as the most liberal. <laughs> and then you'll hear what's happening over there. You'll get a sense of what the future of America is going to look like, uh, you know, in terms of our education, in terms of what the education is. So, uh, so um, there's a lot to say about Reed College because a lot has been happening there. Uh, most recently, uh, there's been a sit-in. You remember, uh, like the the uh, the sit-ins that uh, students used to do in the 1960s, where there's a sitting sit-in. Basically, uh, students have occupied the administrative building now for 11 days. They're rotating. 40, 50 students at a time sitting in and occupying the administrative building. The, the school has actually had to close down its finance office. It's actually had to move sensitive documents to a new location. Of course, the one thing the administration is not considering is bringing in the police and dragging these students out and maybe putting them in jail. That would be, that would be assertive and that would be violent. And oh my God, you can't do that. And the sit-in is organized by a group called Reedies. Reedies from Reed against racism. Reedies against racism. As if anybody from Reed is not against racism. As if we're not all claiming to be against racism. We'll see how against racism they really are uh, in a minute. But not only are they sitting in, but they are abusing staff members. They're harassing staff members. And uh, and what is the administration doing about it? Nothing. Now, why are they sitting in? Why are they sitting in? <clears throat> They're sitting in to protest the fact that Reed College has a business relationship with Wells Fargo, who is considered an unethical bank. And why is it considered an unethical bank? Because I guess it has some corporate partnerships, corporate partnership with private prisons and with the Dakota Access Pipeline. So we're not talking about, I don't know, Wells Fargo funding terrorism or Wells Fargo... Uh, I don't know, uh, even being, uh, I can't even think what, what could be incredibly horrific. No, they have a relationship with private prisons and they have some kind of business relationship with the Dakota Pipeline. And for that, uh, staff members are being harassed, physically threatened. For that, the, the, the administrative building, parts of the administration are being shut down. And, uh, you know, this is what the Reedies for racism, against racism, although they, their name should be Reedies for racism. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, I'll just give you, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, they, 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 they claim that the relationship that this school has with Wells Fargo is racist um, and that it harms brown students and black students and creates potential for the system to be continuously perpetuated, the system of racism, institutionalized racism. Why? Because Wells Fargo has a business relationship with private prisons and the Dakota Access Pipeline. How does that have any impact on brown and black students? Nobody says. I guess because brown and blacks are, uh, are disproportionately in the prison system or something like that. I, they don't explain it, right? They don't have to explain it. They declared Wells Fargo is a racist organization and therefore having to do anything with them is banned. And all they have to do is declare it. Any explanation would be oppressive to them. And I'll explain why any explanation will be oppressive to them. These people don't have to explain anything. When we come back, we have to take a quick break here. You're listening to the Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, you're listening to the Run Book Show. And by the way, I have a, uh, I have a new website. A new website you should all go visit, uronbrookshow.com, uronbrookshow.com. And also on the website, you'll see some information how you can support this show and, 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 and keep it going. 
if you want in on the conversation today, if you have any commentary on the state of American politics, or if you'd like to talk about your experiences in American campuses, read college and such, call in 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. Any students out there who have experience with this nonsense? I've just got started in Reed College because uh, it's just amazing what's going on there. The sit-in is the least of what's happening. This Reedies Against Racism, uh, which was founded a a couple of years ago, actually last year, on September 26, 2016. Uh, It was a response to the police shootings and a, a Facebook post Everything's a response to Facebook posts. I think our lives revolve, revolve these days just around Facebook posts. But it was a post by actor Isaiah Washington who urged, quote, every single African-American in the United States that, has really, that was really fed up with being angry, sad, and disgusted. So rise up. Make your voices heard. So a response on Reed was the creation of Reedies against racism. Right, And they they boycotted classes for one day. And then they put out 25 demands on that day. And the number one demand that they had was reforming a class that every freshman at Reed College has to take. It's called Humanities 110. This is a year-long course that all freshmen take together, right? And it, it has both classes taught by professors and then Small breakout classes where the students learn how to discuss, debate, and defend their readings. There's some quoting out of Reed's kind of manual on this. The, the Humanities 110 class is basically a Western civilization class. It is a class about the foundations and the basis of Western civilization, of liberal humanities thinking. And here I use the word liberal not in the modern sense to denote crazy leftists, but in the traditional sense of, you know, Western liberal freedom uh, market kind of uh, kind of a view of, of, of individual liberty. That's what liberalism used to mean. So. So they defined Reedies against racism, defined this class as a racist class. Why? Why? Because they were reading Greeks. And they were reading uh, Persians and Mesopotamians and Egyptians, right? So the the text includes Mediterranean, Mesopotamian, Persia, and Egyptian readings. And they decided that this was Eurocentric, Caucasioid, I didn't even know that was a word, and as a consequence, oppressive. It was offensive to students of color. One uh, one of these uh, readies against racism quotes as saying, it feels like a cool test for students of color. It traumatized my peers. They're traumatized by reading Plato. They're traumatized by reading Aristotle. And they have demanded that the syllabus be redesigned to include, of course, more readings from more different parts of the world. Now, the fact is that the fact is that this part of the world, Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, Persia, Egypt, and primarily Greece, is where most of human knowledge originates from. It's the place where writing, mathematics, science, logic were discovered, invented. This is where civilization comes from. The fact is that in sub-Sahara Africa, there is no civilization, was no civilization. The fact is that in you know, there's, there's, there's Chinese, there's civilization in China, which is worth, I guess, uh, studying. But this is about Western civilization. This is about the world in which we live. And indeed, even China today is much more Western than it is. It's much more rooted in ideas of the West than it is rooted in ideas that come from Chinese civilization. So the most important ideas that we understand today Oh, Western ideas. Now, Western ideas happen to be the best ideas. And, and let, let's, let's define what best means. Best means consistent with human nature. Best means consistent with human flourishing, with human success, with human prosperity, with human freedom. Those are the right ideas to be studying. 
good for humanities 110, good for Reed College, having a, a, a course on Western civilization. Indeed, some universities, some universities don't have a course on Western civilization because of opposition from either faculty or students. So here's Reed College, one of the most liberal colleges in the country, actually teaching students about Greek civilization, getting students to read the pre-Socratics and Plato and Aristotle and the great plays and studying the, the art of the, of the Greeks. These are the foundational ideas that all humanity benefits from, no matter what skin color you have, no matter what your ethnic origin is, no matter where you come from. The only good ideas, the only pro-life, the only pro-human flourishing ideas come from this Western tradition. They come from, they originate with the Greeks. The Greek philosophy, philosophy was discovered as a field of human study by the Greeks. No, this is racist. I don't even know that the Greeks, the original Greeks, were, were whites in a sense that we understand that term today. I don't know what white even means, but, you know, because it's a, it's a complete fiction. The exact genetic makeup of the, Greek, of, the, of the historical Greeks is not the same makeup of the Greeks today. Who knows? They, they, were, they, they were probably an Asian tribe. Somewhere from Central Asia. But who cares? Who knows? What difference does it make? You're not studying their genetic makeup. You're studying their ideas. Ideas are not racial. Ideas are not genetic. Ideas are not about ethnicity. This is why I say Reedies against racism are really Reedies for racism. They are racists. Because any attempt to identify the ideas of a person with his race not study certain ideas because of the race of that person. Not study Aristotle because he was so-called supposedly white is racist. Any attempt to place race as a primary or as important in any way is racist. Racism is the, the primitive, barbaric, collectivistic idea that says that what defines you is not your character. What defines you is not your ideas. What defines you is not who you are and what you are as a human being, but what defines you is your genetics. It's a disgusting ideology. It's a disgusting ideology that these leftist students have completely, utterly, unapologetically embraced in totality. I cannot think of more racist people today than these. Now, they are racists on the right as well. But these racists make those racists on the right in, in many ways possible. All right, so they oppose, they, they oppose this humanities class. And uh, they have uh, they've occupied the building and they occupied libraries. And they've, they've, uh, they've disrupted class more than 60 times. We're going to take, a, we've got the news break coming up here, so I'm not going to get too far into this. But when we come back from the break, I want to go deeper into what they're actually doing, how they're intimidating faculty members, intimidating students, they're using violence, how they're taking over classes, and what they're doing to disrupt these classes. It's fascinating and disgusting at the same time. Uh, so stay tuned for after the break. You're listening to your Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we will be back. Hi, everybody. Hope, uh, hope you're having a good weekend so far. Welcome to the second hour of the Iran Book Show. By the way, if, you, if you've missed any past episode or you have uh, missed a portion of a show, you can catch all of that on my new website, iranbrookshow.com, in addition to, of course, any podcasting app or soundcloud.com and you can pretty much, YouTube, you can pretty much find the Iran Book Show everywhere on the web. So uh, uh, don't miss out and please visit, visit my website. Uh, a lot of uh, cool content there, a lot of past shows and past podcasts and lectures I've done and courses I've given. So uh, everything Iran Book on the IranBookShow.com 
website. Um, so we were talking about these students at uh, Reed College, one of the most liberal colleges in the United States, but a, a, a place that trains many of the PhDs of the future, many of our teachers in the future, a place that is considered maybe the most liberal college in the United States. And it has, it, 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 it has this group, Reedies Against Racism, which I would argue who are real, are the real racists in the story. Anyway, at Reed College, they have a course called Humanities 110. It's, it sounds like a pretty good course. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted. I'd, I'd like to sit in, although my guess is that it's being taught by very, very left-wing professors. So the content, they, I would probably be pretty upset by the content, although they claim they encourage debate. I wonder, I wonder if somebody challenges the professors on some of what they say, whether they would, uh, <clears throat> whether they would actually be open to that debate. I, I don't know, and I don't want to judge them. Maybe they're great, right? But this Reedies Against Racism wants to shut down this course. And what it's done is it's, it's disrupted the classroom 60 times, uh, mostly last year. The school year has just started this year. And what did they do? How did they disrupt the class? We'll get to what they did this year, but how did they disrupt the class? What they do is, and I've seen pictures of this. It's pretty wild. The professor standing at the podium, kind of lecturing, and what the Reedies Against Racism do is they all, they sit right next to the professor up front in the class, facing the students with big signs. The signs say, we demand space for students of color. Well, I think they have space. They're right there. I, I don't know what that means, right? We demand space for students of color. Oh, we cannot be erased. Who, who wants to erase you? Who's trying? To, I mean, F Humanities 110. Lots of vulgarities that I can't say on the radio. Lots of vulgarities, right? Stop silencing black and brown voices. The rest of society is already standing on their necks. And on and on and on. Just signs. And of course, many of the signs have photos of black Americans who've been killed by police. So this is in front of the class. You're a professor. I've been a professor. Standing on the stage, standing on a, by the podium, trying to lecture. And you've got these students waving things. And you're a student, more importantly, you're a student trying to learn. And these are freshmen. This is their first encounter with class at a college level. And, and they're standing there and they want to learn. And instead of actually having an opportunity to listen to professor talk about Greece and, and the, 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 the birthplace of civilization and, and maybe even talk about Rome, instead of that, they can hear the professor, but they're constantly distracted by these signs in their face and by these messages that mean nothing other than to obstruct. And this is the learning environment these freshmen face. face. The professors are harassed. So there's a professor, but her name is Lucia Martinez Valdivia. I can guess she's Hispanic. And she has pre-existing PTSD. Don't know what the source of that is, but she has PTSD. And she said, look, it's these protests, it's going to be difficult for me to face them. It's going to reignite my PTSD. Please don't come to protest when I teach the class. And the Reedies for racism, um, you know, they, they wrote an open letter to her. They offered a little bit of sympathy for her PTSD. And then they accused her of being anti-black and discriminating against those with disabilities. I don't know where that came from, because she's PTSD. And they never specified the charges. They never actually said why she's anti-black or why she discriminates against disabilities. And when they were asked, could you give us some specifics? What has she done? What's her crime? This is the answer, and this is, this is very revealing, I think. They said, quote, asking for people to display their trauma so that you feel sufficiently justified is a form of violence. <laughs> so asking people to actually give reasons for the accusations they make against other people is a form of violence. I mean, this is nuts. This is what's going on in American campuses. This is where you're sending your kids to school. This is what you're paying thousands, no, tens of thousands of dollars for their tuition so that they can encounter other kids who believe this crap. Ugh. One of the accusations against this professor is that she wore a T-shirt that said, poetry is lit. Poetry is lit. Okay. 
And they say, that's wrong. She can't wear a T-shirt like that. Why? Because she's appropriating, appropriating African-American vernacular English. And that is a form of anti-blackness. So I guess lit, L-I-T, is a form of African-American vernacular English. I didn't know that. That's new to me. And that anybody who's not black is not allowed to say the word lit because then you're appropriating their language and it's a reflection of anti-blackness. I would think it was a form of respect. Isn't flattery a form of respect? But yeah, I mean, now there's this big thing. You can't dress up like somebody from a different ethnic group. You can't listen to their music. Oh, I've got a, I've got a great one about listening to their music. So there was a dance at this, there's a party at this, um, at Reed College. And I guess they were going to play some music sung by, it was uh, by black people, right? I guess. I mean, a lot of the popular music is such. So the Reedies for Racism put out a declaration saying, and, and I'm quoting, this is what they wrote. They're requesting that students, specifically white students, so white students give a suggested amount of $5 to Reedies Against Racism if they planned on consuming black and brown culture at the ball. This money explicitly regarded as reparations was collected at the door by student activists. So this is the... <laughs> so you have to pay them reparations because you are consuming their, their culture. Because black singers are primarily black and belong to black people. And if a white person listened to a, a song by a black person, that is cultural appropriation that has to be compensated for. You have to pay reparations for the damage you're doing to black culture by listening. I mean, I can't even repeat this stuff. It's such garbage. And it's so nonsensical. And it's so racist, 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 racist. And I wish somebody would call them. I, I wish some of these guys would come to my lectures and ask a question so I could say, no, you are the racist. Because that's exactly what they are. They place race above all else, and therefore they're racist. Now, the theory says, and this is a theory that a lot of professors support, that a black person cannot be racist. Only whites can be racist. This is the whole intersectionality theory that exists today on American campuses. Only the oppressed, only, only the oppressors are racist. The oppressed can never be racist. But exactly what Reedies for Racism is doing is oppressing. It's exactly what they're doing by, by, by disrupting these classes. Indeed, at the beginning of this year, they stopped the class. They started. They, they took over the microphone and stopped the class and wouldn't let the professors teach. They wouldn't let the professors teach. And they've done that now three times this year, not letting the class go forward, not just standing there with signs, but taking over the class and not letting people teach, coming up with their own statements, claiming that it was just as important to hear them than it was to hear the professor, not what your parents are paying, not what parents are paying kids paying the, the universities for, to listen to some crazy nuts rather than listen to... Now, often the professors are crazy nuts, but okay, they're professors. They're educated crazy nuts, supposedly. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable. So they stopped classes three times. And, it, and, and of course, what's the administration doing? And this is, this is, I think, indicative. It's appeasing them. So they've given them to their demands. They've had meetings. So they've had meetings. So, so the administration has given into most of the demands. They've hired, they've had new hires in the Office of Inclusive Community. So there's an office at this university, which you are paying for with your tuition money for the Office of Inclusive Community. They are fast-tracking the reevaluation of Humanities 110 syllabus. And they are having, the, having these six-by-six six meetings. Think about this. Six racist, uh, sorry, readies for racism students and six humanities professors to solicit ideas for the syllabus. Now, remember, so they're basically soliciting ideas for a class from 
students, but not for many students, the most nutty, crazy, racist students. Now, it turns out that the, the meetings have ended because the students were, were offended by the fact that the faculty members were insisting that like Aristotle be included in the new syllabus. And, and they found it to quote that they were forced to sit in hours of fruitless meetings, listening to full grown adults cry about Aristotle, the most important philosophy in human history, philosopher in human history. They felt that was uh, insulting. Now I, I want to end this segment just on, on a little bit of good news. And the good news is that, um, that the freshman class now, the freshman class at Reed College is up in arms about this. They're not tolerating this. They're actually uh, speaking up against uh, Reedies for racism for the first time. In the past, the, the freshmen have just gone along and they've been silent, partially because they were intimidated, not because they agree. Most of the students at Reed don't agree with what's going on, but they've been intimidated. They've been, they've been harassed. They've been violently threatened. This freshman class is standing up for them. And indeed, Reedies for Racism has seen a dramatic decrease in, their, uh, in the number of people affiliated with their organization. So the good news is maybe, if, if we look across American campuses, the good news might be that there's a rebellion against the craziness, that students, from the students, are standing up. And even the faculty, so... One of the faculty members published a, a editorial in the Washington Post attacking Reedies for racism. Students now are standing up. Maybe, 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 maybe. All of us talking up against this issue, all the free speech is, uh, campaign that the Ayn Rand Institute and many others have been engaged in over the last year or so, maybe it's finally starting to resonate. Maybe, maybe, maybe one can hope on American campus now there's a backlash against the sheer nuttiness of what's going on. And then we can go back to the regular nuttiness that is American campuses. But the, 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 the craziness that's been happening recently on some of these universities, not on all of them, but some of them, maybe that's declining. Maybe there is some hope. All right. You're listening to the Iran Book Show. We're, uh, we're fighting against these trends. And we're going to be back. A lot more to talk about right after this break. All right, so um, this is the show where uh, you're going to be challenged and where no topic is off limits and you're going to hear perspectives and you're going to hear opinions that you're not used to, that are not mainstream, that are not part of the traditional left or the traditional right or the traditional anything. This is the Iran Book Show where we discuss ideas from the perspective of my philosophy, the philosophy of objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, the philosophy of Atlas Shrugged. Most of you read the book Atlas Shrugged. And so I want to take up, we just talked about the nuttiness of the right. So now I want to take up an issue which is part of the nuttiness of the left and, and, a, and, a, and a sensitive issue for the Blaze listeners. But, you know, here we go. So the U.S. Department of Health and Services, Health and Human Services, why we even have such a department, why the government is involved in health and human services at all, don't even get me started. But okay, there's a department, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And they put out a five-year plan, just like the Soviets. They put out a five-year strategic plan. This one's for 2018 to 2022. And this new plan unequivocally states that life begins, that human life, human life begins at conception and deserves protection. Human life begins at conception. Now, put aside the fact that this contradicts the Supreme Court ruling of Roe versus Wade. Put aside that. This is biological ignorance. This is just plain not true. And this is fundamentally the placing of religion into government. The bringing forward of a religious idea as fundamental to the future, to the strategic plan of a government entity. Beyond that, the new plan has 40 references, all friendly, all positive, all cooperative, 
40 references to faith-based organizations and upholding the rights of faith-based entities. Again, in my view, a clear violation of the separation of church and state. The government has no role in religion. It has no role in faith. What about my secular beliefs? What about my secular preferences? What about my rights as an individual human being who has no faith, as the listeners of this show, regular listeners of this show know, and those of you first time are about to find out, I'm an atheist, a proud atheist. I don't have rights under the Constitution? That is absurd. That is anti-American. And yet, 40 references to faith-based organizations, the work we're going to do with them, protecting this, protecting that, all from the perspective of religion. This is a clear violation of the American Constitution. But nobody cares. Nobody brings this up. Nobody talks about this. It's okay. It's okay to violate the Constitution for Republicans if it's in the name of religion. You just elected, uh, what's his name, Judge Moore, to, 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 be, uh, to probably be the next senator from Alabama, who has explicitly violated the Constitution, and then when told that he was violating the Constitution by the federal court, just ignored the federal court and was deemed in what? You know, uh, uh, I mean, talk about disrespecting America. Talk about disrespecting the flag. Talk about disrespecting the principles on which this country was founded. Judge Moore is disrespectful of all of those things. And yet he's the nominee for Senate of the Republican Party. Again, why I believe it's time to end the Democratic and Republican Party. It's time for a third party that actually understands the American Constitution. Now, I want to talk about why, you know, why. And, and by the way, the Health and Human Services also implies that they're against assisted suicide. Also, I think, a perversion. If you have a right to life, which the Declaration of Independence secures, you have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have a right to life, which means you get to decide how to live your life. That also means, has to mean, that you have a right to end it. You have a right to decide when your life should be over. It's your life. That's what a right to life means. It's yours. You can't have a right to life if you don't have a right to end it. But not based on the health and human services. They they have the phrase in it, conception to natural death, three times in the draft, three times, just for emphasis, to make it clear what they believe. Again, the interjection of religion into government, into government policies. But I want to say a little bit about this idea of human life beginning at conception, which I think is just scientifically wrong. Now, think about this. In a laboratory, put aside sex. Think about it in a laboratory where human eggs are fertilized almost every day for in vitro, in, in vitro, outside of the human body. The human egg is a single living cell. And a sperm is a cell. Now, this single living cell, the, 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 it's, it's, it's a cell like a skin cell, like any cell in your body. It's not a human being. It's a cell. It's alive, but it's not human life. Now, when it gets fertilized by the sperm, what it becomes is a one-cell embryo, not a human being, just a, a single-cell entity. We are not single-cell entities. And, you know, the egg and the sperm were already alive separately, and now they're together, and they're still alive. But again, not human. Nearly 48 hours pass from the time the sperm first binds and enters the egg until the first cell division, and now you have two cells. 48 hours. 48 hours is just one cell. That's not human life. Now, these two newly formed cells then have the potential the potential to give rise to a human being only if they can be implanted into a uterus and properly nurtured in that uterus and, and, and that there's no, there are no problems. 50%, 50% of 
normal embryos, whether implanted or naturally conceived, 50% of them don't make it. Don't make it. And when they don't make it, that's not death of a human being. That cells that didn't divide enough, that didn't, it didn't work. But it's still a clump of cells. It's not more than that at that point. All it is, all an embryo is, is a collection of stem cells, each of which has the capacity to grow into any part of the placenta or into fetal tissues and organs. But it's not human life. It's not human life. To define it as such for the, for the health and service service, human services is just an attempt to bring religion into its policymaking. It's an attempt to justify restricting certain forms of contraception. I don't understand how you can limit contraception. What kind of, you know, what kind of attitude limits the ability to control whether during sex you have children or not? You have, you know, you ultimately get pregnant or not. And to restrict abortion. That's the only purpose of this. And restricting abortion is, goes against Supreme Court rulings. So look, and, and ultimately, this is going to be restrict the ability to have in vitro fertilization. What happens to, to uh, you know, IVFs or, 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 or that are discarded? Is that, is that murder? Are you destroying human life when you destroy a, a, just a, 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 these cells that are being conceived outside of the human body? Really? Is the after... You know, the day after pill, is that murder? Really? It's no human life there, guys. I know. I know. All right. You're listening to your Ron Brooks show, where we don't shun controversy. And we'll be right back after this break. All right. You're listening to your Ron Brooks show, where we take on all these issues, nuttiness on the left, nuttiness on the right. And look, while the nuttiness on the left is, is in you know, so so outrageously obvious. I consider the nuttiness on the right as just as dangerous. And I'm sorry, religion has no place in politics. You don't want to use contraception? Don't use contraception. You have every right not to use contraception. But the idea that you can force me not to use contraception is absurd. You want to um, ignore science and ignore facts and define life, human life, as starting at conception, do it. Don't use in vitro. Don't use contraception. Don't have an abortion. Fine. You don't get to dictate that for me. You don't get to tell me how to live my life. You don't get to tell me what values I should pursue. You don't get to tell me, when I'm on the side of science, that the clump of cells that is an embryo, certainly in the first three months of pregnancy, is a human being and should be treated as a human being. It's not, and it shouldn't be. It's a potential, but it's not. So you can have a debate, I think, over abortion in the final trimester, but you cannot have a debate over abortion in the first trimester. There's nothing approximating murder in the abortion in the first trimester. There's nothing about the fetus in the first three months, that is human life. It's a potentiality, not an actuality. And, you know, in that sense, the right is trying to violate my rights. And, and we talked about, in a previous show, we talked about religious freedom. And it's the same thing. When, when, when you, give, when you uh, write laws that provide uh, those with a religious conscious special rights, or, or maybe freedoms, which, which they deserve, but you deny those freedoms from somebody who does not share their faith. That is discrimination. That is not the rule of law. That is not equality before the law. That is not the protection of individual rights. That goes against all that. There is no such thing as religious liberty or religious freedom. There is just liberty and freedom. Somebody who does not believe in what you believe in has just the same rights as you do. That's the principle on which this country was founded. 
That's the principle that conservatives are supposedly want to conserve. Well, then do it. Stand up for liberty, freedom, without any qualifications. And don't try to use government force to dictate other people's morality. All right, if you want in on this conversation, 888-900-3393. And the last segment of every show we do, we call it a moment of reason, and you can call in with questions about anything, anything. Uh, so uh, uh, call in 888-900-3393, and you can ask me anything you want, and I'll take your question in the last segment. I know Tyler, Skyler is called in, and he's going to wait patiently till that final segment because his question is not about something we've covered. Although I, I think it was Skyler on one of the comment sections online said that I, I, I was not I was not uh, correctly understanding what lit means in um, uh, in poetry is lit because uh, you know I'm not part of I guess popular culture so I don't get what lit means and lit doesn't mean literature what lit means is cool uh, exciting thrilling it, it, you know in I guess rap culture or whatever and and it's misappropriation when some white dude like me uses that word although. I don't even define myself as white because I don't know, I don't know what that means. Um, particularly if you if you, if you do a, a, an actual genetic analysis and you figure out where all of us comes from, we all started out in Africa. I don't know what that makes us today, what that means even. Uh, all right, so um, I've got a bunch of like uh, just crazy stories to share with you. Just some crazy news articles in in, in further on on the steam of. Uh, the world's gone insane that uh, I thought I'd share with you. And uh, <laughs> it's just nuts, right? All right, so you know how we have to replace all our lights with LEDs because that's how we're going to save the planet from, from, from global warming and it reduces the use of electricity and therefore reduces the use of CO2 emissions. And, and this is just a huge value and LED lights are pushed everywhere, right? I'm sure you have LED lights in your house. It's almost impossible to buy lights that's not LED light today. I mean, the government is really pushing this and incentivizing us and subsidizing it and, and really getting behind this. And, and you know, it, it seems pretty innocuous. Okay, well, LED lights, they last longer and all this stuff. So it turns out that the city of Winnipeg up in Canada, which snows a lot and it freezes a lot and it's really cold, they put LEDs in the traffic lights, right? That makes sense. They, they replaced all the traffic lights. They put LEDs. Now, the problem is this. The one of the advantages, the great advantages of LED lights is they don't generate heat, right? So that's why they're more efficient, more expensive, but also more efficient because they don't generate a lot of heat. So they're not wasted energy. The energy just goes for light. And, and that's what defines their efficiency. Well, Winnipeg is cold. And not generating heat is a disadvantage when you're talking about traffic lights. Why? Because on traditional traffic lights, the heat, what the heat does is it melts the snow and ice that accumulates on the traffic lights. And in Winnipeg, it doesn't. So the ice and the snow are obstructing the ability of drivers to see whether it's green, red, or yellow. You can't see the light. There's too much snow in front of it. And it's not melting. So the city of Winnipeg has hired people basically their staff, I guess, during snowstorms and when it's cold, which is pretty much all the time in Winnipeg, they would really benefit from some global warming. They go around town to wipe clean the traffic lights. Now, think about the efficiency, the energy saving, the enormous advantages of actually having human beings drive around town in, in gas-guzzling automobiles I mean, <laughs> to literally engage in manual labor of wiping the traffic lights clean. I mean, I don't know, more insanity. I mean, the world is going nuts. And, you know, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? I guess education, 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 we talk about it, right? So we're going backwards. We're going backwards. Technology is consumes too much energy, so let's shut it down, right? Let's turn off electricity. 
Let's turn off our computers because you know what? It's it's harming the environment. And and to hell with human life. Who cares about human life? I see. I care about human life, not cells, not embryos. I care about human life. Human life requires energy. Human life requires consuming energy. Human life requires lights that melt the snow in traffic. Otherwise, people are going to die from traffic accidents. It's insane. The world is going insane. <laughs> All right, so that's one example of, of, this, uh, of this insanity. Whoops. What happened to Skyler? He, he, uh, he dropped off the call. All right, maybe he'll be back. He'll call back. All right. Um, all right. So that's that's LED lights, right? All right. Then you get you get Prince William. I don't know. He's like something to the throne. He's going to be king of England one day. That really important job of of ruling over the British Empire. Oh, I guess they don't do that anymore, do they? They they, they don't believe in empire or ruling or anything like that. Anyway, he's going to be king of England one day. Maybe he's the Duke of Cambridge. And he is really worried, really worried about the terrible impact of having too many people in the world. <laughs> Overpopulation, that's his concern. That's the worry, right? As if this is new. Overpopulation. Um, and and the, the, it's not new. The Duke of Edinburgh in 2011, same thing. Voluntary family limitation as a mean of solving overpopulation. How is overpopulation a problem? When has overpopulation ever been a problem? Human beings are value. Human beings are good things, not bad things. They don't create problems. They solve problems. That's the beauty of freedom. When human beings are left free, where their rights are protected, where they're free from force, they produce more than they consume. They increase wealth. They make the planet better for human beings. They make human life better. I want another billion people to live on Earth if they are free, if they can produce, if they can think, if they can be productive, because life will be better with another billion people. My life, your life. But this panic about overpopulation, by the way, a panic that every few years comes about, right? 1800, you had... Uh, it, 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 Overpopulation is going to cause the population of Europe to shrink dramatically. And in the hundred years that follow, the population of Europe triples and we get fat because we're so well fed and we're so, you know, our living standards have gone up so much. That's the 19th century. Right? And then in the 1970s, 60s, we were warned, oh, my God, overpopulation is going to cause again in Europe hundreds of millions of people to die of starvation. It didn't happen. And then every few years, somebody comes up with, this time it's going to happen. Overpopulation is going to... But that's not how the world works. It's not how life works. People don't just consume. They're not dead pests. Human beings are not pests. They just eat up everything. Human beings are producers. And they produce more than they consume. And they create higher standard of living and make wealth possible and make technology possible and more humans being beings mean more production means more wealth means more technology means more good stuff so prince william sorry mm, you're wrong all right insanity all around me craziness all around me all right when we come back we're going to do the moments of reason if we have callers, so 888-900-3393 to call about anything you want to talk about. 888-900-3393. Call to disagree with me. Call to argue with me. Or call to, to bring up a topic we haven't talked about yet. 888-900-3393. And we'll be back after these break. Uh, this break. You're listening to Ron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right. I think we'll title today's show, The World's Gone Crazy Left and Right. I don't know. Yeah, may, I'll try and be in a better mood uh, n next show. It'll be from uh, from London. And actually, the show after that will be from Warsaw, Poland. So you're going to get, uh, if you follow the Iran Book Show, you get uh, you get me traveling around the world and uh, experiencing a little bit through the internet of uh, 
through the magic of the internet, a little bit of what uh, what I experience when I'm out there traveling around uh, around the world. You can also find everything that I do on the Iran Brook Show, not the, just IranBrookShow.com. And you can also support this show if you're so inclined. Uh, help us uh, in, improve the marketing of the show, improve some of the technical aspects of the show, just to help support uh, and what hopefully you're getting some value out of and uh, value for value. I believe in that. Win-win. It's all about win-win. All right. Uh, we have got a number of people. Oh, my God. Wow. We've got like how many people have we got now? We've got Mike, Skyler, Brian, and Izzy. All right, we're going to take Skyler first because he called a long time ago. Then we're going to go to Mike. Then we're going to go to Brian. And then we're going to go to Izzy. So uh, let's start with Skyler. Hi, Skyler. You're on the Iran Brooks show. And you want me to talk greetings, about. Greetings, Dr. Brooks. Greetings. And we don't have a lot of time. So jump in with a question. And it's so like you yeah, go to, I can go to next one. Yep. Why is it that Mozart can compose symphonies at eight years old? And it usually takes a novelist in their 20s or 30s to compose a novel. Why? What is the, difference, the fundamental difference between art from music and literature? Oh, my and God. Are you going you to kill my audience, Skyla? What are you, what are you <laughs> doing to my show? I'm just trying to bring it from, from politics to aesthetics. There you go. Well, the fundamental difference is that uh, literature is conceptual. Literature is about words. Literature is about ideas. Literature is about the conceptual nature of man. It's about the ideas that guide man. And, and, uh, literature evokes emotion. It's the, it's the conceptual nature of the story that evokes an emotion. And we experience literature emotionally, but it comes to us through words, through concepts, through ideas that evoke that emotion. Music is, is, goes direct somehow to emotion. You respond emotionally. There are no ideas. There are no words. There are no concepts. There's, there's nothing to understand in terms of conceptual words, conceptual knowledge. It goes somehow, and I don't know how, and I don't know that anybody knows how. It, certainly, I don't know how. Ayn Rand had some theories about it, but even she said these are just theories. These are just my musings about it about how music affects us directly. In a sense, they kind of skip over our conscious conceptual faculty and go straight to subconscious and to our emotions. That's the fundamental difference. And look, Mozart is, a, is not a good example because Mozart is a, 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 an unbelievable uh, genius. But, but you can find children humming tunes. It's very hard to, uh, to have a child articulate something conceptually it's far harder to learn concepts than to come up with with, with a tune now what mozart did I'm not, i don't want to belittle what mozart did because mozart was a unique genius but for whatever reason that's the, i think it's because of the nature of concepts and how hard they are and music somehow circumvents them in in some interesting way which i don't have an explanation for all right. Thank you, Skyler. Appreciate it. We're going to go quickly to Mike in Georgia. Hey, Mike. Hey, how are you doing, uh, Mr. Brooks? I'm doing uh, well. I basically had two questions. Yeah, um, go ahead. First question was, where in the Constitution does it actually speak about the separation of church and state? Yep. The second question I had is, where do you believe your liberties and freedom come from? All right, good. Great questions. Go to the heart of the issue. Um, I believe that the Second Amendment uh, separates church and state. Uh, that is its intent. Uh, it uses language that is a different, di a little different than the language uh, we use today. You can tell Jefferson at least intention by the Virginia Declaration of Rights of Man, where, where he talks about a, a wall of separation between church and state. This country was founded on Enlightenment principles, on secular Enlightenment principles, on the idea that I, that, uh, the ideas held by politicians, including their religion, should not guide government. That what guided government was the protection of individual rights, period. That the responsibility of government was not to impose or not to restrict or not to intervene in the realm of ideas, in the realm of religion, but only to defend our rights, only to protect our liberties and otherwise to leave us alone. 
So uh, I believe if one understands the founding fathers, one reads the context of the Constitution, and one reads the Enlightenment figures that led to the creation of, of the greatest country in human history and the only moral country in human history, then uh, you cannot ignore the fact that this is fundamentally, essentially, a secular country built on the idea that religion has no place in government, has no place in government. It, the only place it has is in your life. You are left free to believe and to practice your religion how you see. As long as you're not using violence against your neighbor, you can believe whatever you want and you have a right to practice your religion in any way you want, as long as it's not harmful to other people. The second question is where do rights come from? Rights come from the nature of man. They come from who we are as, as biological entities. It, it is a requirement for human survival. It's a requirement for human flourishing. Without individual rights, there is no ability of human beings to flourish and succeed and, and, uh, and, and, you know, survive as, as fully conceptual human beings. Rights cannot, well, in my view, they cannot come from God because God, there is no God. But, Right, the argument that rights come from God is a very, very weak argument because what you're basically saying is, I don't have a reason-based argument for why human beings have rights. Therefore, I must resort to faith. And that is very weak. And that's why individual rights have be, you know, are not protected anymore in the United States of America. The Constitution is not, is disregarded, is not regarded anymore because uh, in a conflict between faith and reason, reason will always win. And unfortunately, uh, the the conventional convention, co conventional positions in politics have no reason based def de de defense of individual rights. Only Ayn Rand has such a defense, and that's why I encourage you all to read Ayn Rand. Particularly, she has a, a wonderful essay called Man's Rights. You can find it on our website, aynrand.org, A-Y-N-R-E-N-D.org. Individual rights are a requirement of human survival in a social context. They come from human nature. And uh, you don't need faith, you don't need religion, you don't need certainly don't need Christianity or Judaism or Islam or any specific religion or religion at all to advocate for individual rights. And I think most of our founders completely understood this. Now, I know that Brian and Izzy are on the line, and unfortunately... Uh, I'm going to take Brian quickly. If you could, Brian, can you say something really quickly about LED lighting? Because we have less than a minute to go. Brian? All right. He's not there. I, I have no idea what he was, uh, what he was planning on saying. But, uh, all right. So, you know, as, as, as I've always said, you're going to hear a different perspective on the show. You're going to hear a different philosophical, cultural, political point of view on the show. Hopefully, Mike, I know you disagreed with my statement about individual rights, but hopefully it gets you thinking and hopefully it gets you reading, exposes you to a different approach to life, to reality, to, to ideas. All right. You're listening to Iran Book Show. This is the Blaze Radio Network, and I'll see you same time. I won't be in the same place, but hopefully you will be. Talk to you then. You're listening to the Iran Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network.